welcome back to our special episode. Public Enemy Number One. Part Two? So, where were we at? As far as a housing policy, the HAWF doesn't address one of the major forces behind driving demand for social and affordable housing. That's the rental market. Increasing rent assistance is a good start. However, the Economic Inclusion Advisory Committee recommended that on top of increasing rent assistance, that the government reform its indexation to better reflect rent paid rather than CPI. That's kind of a big deal when you consider the rate at which rental prices are rising in real world terms. And yeah, the government hasn't done that. If the government aren't prepared to come to the table and talk about a rent freeze, they could at the very least look at putting in place rental increase caps. It's something that's been done in Canberra, so why not extend it nationwide? The government could take action on rent because it's the right thing to do. Or they could take action on rent out of self-preservation. Around a third of the population rent. That figure is even higher in capital cities. That's a lot of voters and only a smaller percentage of those will be eligible for any form of rent assistance. And with each increase in rent will come an increase in demand for social and affordable housing. The ALP may have taken negative gearing reform to previous elections and failed, but it's fair to say the world has changed a little since then. The government may be more scared of those benefiting from negative gearing at the moment, but sooner or later there will come a tipping point where that shifts. But blocking the bill is stopping roofs being put over the heads of people today. No, no it's not. Even if the bill passed today, it would be 12 months before the disbursement from the fund would be made to Housing Australia, who in turn could then provide loans and grants in relation to social and affordable housing. When will the first home be built? Well, uh, that will depend on how fast we get the fund through the parliament. We of course already have homes on the ground going on the ground today from the $575 million that we unlocked last year out of the Jobs and Skills Summit. And of course we've got our National Housing Accord which starts on 1 July 2024. I beg your pardon, in relation to this particular fund, assuming that you do get it through, when would the first home be built? Well, it'll take a little while for those returns to come through. So the sooner we can get the fund through, the sooner we can get homes on the ground. Uh, you know, these types of plans and projects take quite a while to get off the ground. So as soon as the bill is passed, we need Housing Australia to be going out there, uh, working with all of the providers, working with the sector, so that we have concrete plans. So as soon as the money's able to flow, we have houses going under construction straight away. Uh, and just briefly, how long do you think that will take? Uh, well, it will take a few months to get the returns from the fund. Uh, we anticipate uh, probably in the first 12 months we'd get a return. Guaranteeing a, a $500 million disbursement from 2024 to 25 each and every year. $500 million will come out from 2024. Uh, guaranteed disbursement. So you might start building something in the second half of 2024. But then there's this. While this has been languishing in the Senate for the last four months, 37,000 Australians have been turned away from you know, short-term crisis accommodation or wanting longer-term social and, and affordable housing. It's 300 Australians a day are seeking that, 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 that need can't be met. Yep, 300 people per day. If we take that figure on face value, all it does is serve to highlight just how inadequate the HAWF is. 300 people per day over six months. That's over 53,000 people. While the government have promised the HAWF will build 30,000 dwellings within five years, even if you want to blindly ignore the fact that building 30,000 homes with what the HAWF will provide does not even sound remotely possible, well, 53,000 people within six months, 30,000 homes in five years, maths, are you starting to see why the HAWF is so inadequate? At least some of the ALP are starting to highlight some of the inadequacy of the initial bill, even if it is inadvertent. Blocking the bill has given the Greens and the crossbench leverage to improve what I'll say again started out as a very ordinary policy. If the Greens had just waved this one through on day one, there'd still be a ceiling on annual expenditure and there'd be no upfront $2 billion back of the couch fund. Perhaps, rather than giving Costello $10 billion to play around with on the stock market, we just invest that $10 billion in housing. I mean, that sounds simple, right? Is it a crazy idea? Well, it's not as crazy as you might think. I'll start by saying how puzzling it is that considering how obsessed this country is with property investment, the housing policy we've, we've come up with to help households being squeezed in rental markets is to not invest in building housing but spend $10 billion investing in non-housing financial assets instead. I feel like satire and reality have met. In the political comedy show Utopia, there's a scene where Rob Sitch's 
character explains to a political staffer that building infrastructure today is fixing the future. This is an infrastructure future fund. It's just something that sounds good. Exactly. It's like a dream, an aspiration. Then where are we disagreeing? On this. We were going to take money from people in order to build infrastructure, but instead we're going to hang on to it for 20 years in order to build infrastructure. Again, no, I don't see where we're disagreeing. Why don't we spend it now? Then you won't have a future fund. You've blown it. Jim, Tony, we're talking a major expansion here. Staff, budgets, new board, new building. Sky's the limit. Thinking about the present fixes the future. No, it doesn't. When we get to the future, you're still in the past. What? Whereas a fund is just a risky, expensive and unnecessary waste. The other thing to consider is that houses are assets. The New South Wales Land and Housing Commission manages the public housing stock in that state and the value of its assets went up from 32 billion in 2012 to 51 billion in 2020, a 7.8% compound return. In capital value alone, Australian dwellings increased 7.7% per year in value net of rental returns since 2006 when the Future Fund was established. What did the Future Fund earn? 7.8% per year return. Had the Future Fund invested directly in building housing in Australia instead of the financial products it did invest in, it probably would have made more money. So perhaps instead of spending tens of millions of dollars a year managing a financial fund and doing further research, we could simply pay the Housing Council or the Future Fund Board to be mystery shoppers and go out to the property market and just buy new dwellings, often in bulk, at a good price from private developers in townhouses, apartments or land and house packages. This would put housing equity, an asset, into the fund, increase the rate of new housing construction and immediately grow the pool of housing to allocate to public housing agencies, CHPs, or my favourite, by lottery, to non-homeowner households. I mean, that does make sense, doesn't it? So why are the Labor faithful? Have I mentioned I hate that term? In case you weren't aware, you don't owe any political party your loyalty. You don't need to stay faithful to a party that no longer represents your values. It's fine to go elsewhere. Anyway, where was I? So why are the Labor faithful so fixated on the Greens? It's pretty simple really, the Greens are a threat. What they are talking about is resonating with younger voters and renters. Deep down, the Labor faithful probably know the HAWF is inadequate, which is just adding to their anxiety. Not even industrial grade gaslighting can distract from the obvious. Maybe the older faithful look at their team today and wonder what's going on. It's probably hard to recognise the actions of the current lineup as representing the values of the team that they've spent their lives barracking for. Did I mention that Max is a former member of the Labor Party? Maybe that's why he grinds their gears. There's an awkward reality for the Albanese government. They need 39 votes in the Senate to pass legislation. There are only 26 Labor senators. To pass any legislation, the government need the support of either the Greens and at least one member of the crossbench, or they need the support of the coalition. Labor will need to learn to work constructively with the Greens or they risk becoming a lame duck. It seems though that the Albanese government are currently feeling more threatened by the Greens than they are the coalition. But the Greens should just pass it and improve it down the line. Think of it this way, if the Greens had just passed it when it was initially raised, there'd be no minimum spend, no indexation, no $2 billion to be spent straight away. The mere fact that the Greens have not waved this through has forced those things to happen. And given how the ALP have had to be dragged kicking and screaming to make those concessions, I think we can fairly safely say the likelihood of them improving the HAWF after it had been agreed to is pretty low. This is how a political system should work. If the government put forward a below par policy, we should have a capable opposition who are able to pressure them to do better. When the best defence the Rusties can mount for this bill is that something is better than nothing or it's a start, you just know that the thing is a steaming pile. You can roll out the tired old political cliche that let's not let uh, perfection be the enemy of the good here as many times as you like, but it's really not relevant here. I mean, maybe perfection shouldn't be the enemy of the good, but bloody hell, inadequate and good should be fairly hostile enemies, I would have thought. Is better than nothing really the bar you want to measure good by? If you can't accept that the bill as presented by the government was grossly inadequate and that the concessions made to improve it so far as well as the $2 billion up front, is not a result of the actions of the Greens, then you're probably divorced from reality. And if you're a lifelong Labor supporter, you are going to hate this. And your first instinct is to attack someone for trying to push the ALP to be better, well... You need to take a long, hard look at yourself right now.
Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe.